Ronald Reagan was the 40th President of the United States and is widely considered to be one of the most popular, influential, and successful chief executives in American history. He served from 1981 to 1989 and initiated an innovative program called the Reagan Revolution, which aimed to reinvigorate the American people and reduce their reliance on government. Ronald Wilson Reagan was born on February 6, 1911, in Tampico, Illinois, to Nellie and John Reagan. He attended high school in nearby Dixon and proceeded to work his way through Eureka College. In college, Reagan studied economics and sociology in addition to playing football and acting in the school plays. After college, he became a radio sports announcer, and after a screen test in 1937, he won a contract in Hollywood where he appeared in 53 films over the next two decades. Reagan's first marriage was to actress Jane Wyman in 1941, and together they had two children, Maureen and Michael. They were divorced in 1948, and in 1952, Reagan remarried his second wife, Nancy Davis, and they had two children named Patricia Ann and Ronald Prescott. Reagan became president of the Screen Actors Guild, and because of this found himself involved in the disputes over the issue of communism in the film industry. As a Democrat, Reagan became a spokesman for General Electric and hosted its national television program for eight years. He then campaigned for U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater for president in 1964, delivering a historic address warning of the evils of socialism that received a lot of national attention. The speech is still considered to be one of the greatest and most important political addresses in the nation's history. Those who would trade our freedom for the soup kitchen of the welfare state have told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation. And they say if we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy, he'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. All who oppose them are indicted as warmongers. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. Well, perhaps there is a simple answer. Not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right, we cannot buy our security, our freedom from the threat of the bomb by committing an immorality so great as saying to a billion human beings now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom because to save our own skins, we're willing to make a deal with your slave masters. Alexander Hamilton said, a nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? Well, Nikita Khrushchev has told his people he knows what our answer will be. He has told them that we're retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary, because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side, he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war, because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? 
Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. And this, this is the meaning in the phrase of Barry Goldwater, peace through strength. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We will keep in mind and remember that Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Thank you very much. Reagan's political views began to change from liberal to conservative, and he started touring the country as a television host, becoming the spokesman for conservatism. In 1966, he was elected governor of California by a million vote margin, and he was re-elected for a second term in 1970. Reagan's crackdown on leftist protesters gave him the respect of conservative leaders across the country, and many began discussing the possibility of Reagan for president. In 1976, a fiercely divided Republican convention took place, and Gerald Ford barely won the nomination. After Reagan's speech, however, the highlight of the convention, many people on both sides felt that they had just nominated the wrong person. If I could just take a moment, and I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now. We live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. In the election of 1976, Ford was beat by Jimmy Carter, and Reagan stayed in the public eye by publishing weekly newspaper columns, a cutting-edge strategy at the time. When President Carter asked the U.S. Senate to ratify a treaty to return the Panama Canal Zone to Panamanian ownership in 1978, Ronald Reagan led the fight against ratification, an effort that ultimately revitalized his political career and landed him in the White House. Four years later, in 1980, Reagan won the Republican presidential nomination. He chose as his running mate former Texas Congressman and United Nations Ambassador George Herbert Walker Bush. His campaign pledge of 1980 was to restore the great, confident roar of American progress and growth and optimism. Voters at the time were troubled by inflation and by the four-year-long confinement of Americans in Iran, and they elected Reagan and Bush with 489 electoral votes to 49. Reagan took office on January 20th, 1981, and within an hour, Iran, which had been holding dozens of American hostages for more than a year, released the former embassy workers. Only 69 days later, John Hinckley attempted to assassinate Reagan outside the Washington Hilton Hotel, with the delusion of impressing his obsession, actress Jodie Foster. Reagan was hit in the left chest, but he quickly recovered and returned to duty, increasing his popularity and winning the hearts of supporters and opponents alike with the grace and wit which he exhibited in response to the incident, 
and the humor he exhibited in telling doctors who were about to operate on him. I hope you're all Republicans. Weeks later, the president surprised nearly everyone by passing the Kemp-Roth 25% income tax cuts through a Democrat-controlled House of Representatives. The cuts are credited with turning around the American economy and mainstreaming supply-side economics. The resulting economic growth caused by the tax cuts resulted in federal government revenues increasing by 96% during Reagan's presidency. During his years as president, Reagan dealt skillfully with Congress and obtained legislation to stimulate economic growth, curb inflation, increase employment, and strengthen national defense. He cut taxes and government expenditures, even refusing to raise taxes when strengthening the defense forces, which led to a large deficit. Reagan's foreign policy sought peace through strength and in his time as president, he increased defense spending 35% while seeking to improve relations with the Soviet Union. In his discussions with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, he was able to negotiate a treaty that would eliminate intermediate-range nuclear missiles. Reagan also declared war against international terrorism and was able to maintain free flow of oil during the Iran-Iraq War by ordering naval escorts in the Persian Gulf. In addition, he supported the anti-communist insurgencies in Central America, Asia, and Africa. Along with a renewal of national self-confidence, Reagan and Bush won a second term against Democratic challengers, former Vice President Walter F. Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro, in 1984, with an unprecedented number of electoral votes. In 1986, Reagan obtained an overhaul of the income tax code, eliminating many deductions and exempting millions of people with low income. In 1994, Reagan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and largely faded from the public view. Reagan passed away on June 5, 2004. He was buried in Southern California near his presidential library after a moving nationally televised funeral service. Ronald Wilson Reagan, the simple boy from Tampico, Illinois, had become the man of the century, changing the course of world history and freeing hundreds of millions of people from the slavery of oppression. There is currently a foundation called the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Library, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the promotion of individual liberty, economic opportunity, global democracy, and national pride. Under Reagan's administration, the nation enjoyed its longest recorded period of peacetime prosperity without recession or depression. The years were marked by prosperity, and the goal of peace through strength seemed to be within grasp. He is credited as the man who defeated Soviet communism and won the Cold War. He is also credited with reviving National Republican Party during the difficult post-Watergate era, serving as the leader of the modern conservative movement and revitalizing the nation's economy through a series of tax cuts.